Day 754 of the Trump administration, and there is new reporting underscoring the importance of that man, Paul Manafort, as former Trump campaign chairman to the Mueller investigation. Tomorrow, Manafort will be back in federal court for a hearing behind closed doors. The judge is expected to rule on whether she believes Manafort lied to prosecutors, a decision that could impact his sentencing greatly. That's coming up in March. But it was a Manafort hearing last week that continues to be of interest, last night and tonight. Just this evening, the Washington Post has new reporting examining the revelations from that hearing, particularly the August 2, 2016 meeting in New York involving Manafort, his deputy Rick Gates, and their Russian associate, Konstantin Kalimnik. Journalist Tom Hamburger, who joins us in a moment, and his colleague Rosalind Helderman write, quote, it was at that meeting that prosecutors believe Manafort and Kalimnik may have exchanged key information relevant to Russia and Trump's presidential bid. They also report, quote, a former senior U.S. intelligence official who spoke on the condition of anonymity called the details about what occurred the most interesting and potentially significant development we have seen in a long time. Manafort, Gates and Kalimnik met at a crucial time during the Trump campaign at a cigar club just blocks from where we are here in Midtown Manhattan. It's called the Grand Havana Room. Happens to be located at 666 Fifth Avenue, a notable address because it was at the time famously owned by the Kushner family. As we've reported, one of Mueller's prosecutors has described this 2016 event as being, quote, at the heart of the Russia investigation. Meanwhile, NBC News reports the Senate Intelligence Committee is nearing the end of its inquiry and that both Republicans and Democrats say they have no direct link, they've seen no direct link, between the Trump campaign and Russia. Today, the Republican chair of that committee made a lot of news by speaking out publicly about his committee's investigation, separate from the Mueller investigation, and what it has found or not found so far. I'm not sure how to put it any clearer than I said it before. We have no factual evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. Now, earlier on this network, a former Justice Department official and a former CIA director took issue with that assessment. The Senate Intelligence Committee does not have the investigative tools and capabilities and powers and the subpoenas and being able to pull financial records and other types of things that the special counsel has. So they don't have Rick Gates cooperating the way that Bob Mueller does and telling them about that meeting with a Russian intelligence asset. They don't have Mike Flynn, the former national security advisor, cooperating and telling them who, if anyone, told him to discuss sanctions relief with the Russian ambassador on the phone call. They don't have Michael Cohen cooperating, telling them the details of the Trump Tower meeting. Now, that Senate Intel chairman, Senator Burr, also blasted former Trump fixer Michael Cohen, who postponed that hearing that was scheduled for today. Any goodwill that might have existed in the committee with Michael Cohen is now gone. On Twitter, a reporter reported he was having a wild night Saturday night, eating out in New York uh, with five buddies. Didn't seem to have any physical uh, limitations. I would prefer to get him before he goes to prison. Um, but, uh, you know, the way he's positioning himself... Uh, not coming to the committee, we may, hope, we may help him go to prison. Cohen, who is supposed to report to prison in early March, has cited medical issues for the reason for his postponement. Late today, his lawyer, Lanny Davis, insisted his client was indeed recovering from shoulder surgery and that he was committed to testifying before the end of the month. As the congressional and Mueller inquiries move forward, there are mounting questions about how the special counsel's findings will be made public, if at all. This continues to be a debate. Today, John Dowd, at one time Trump's lead lawyer for that investigation, made a rather surprising prediction. I don't think there'll be a report. I will be shocked if, if anything regarding the president is made public, other than we're done. USA Today reports that John Pistol, Mueller's deputy at the FBI, had a similar assessment, telling the paper, quote, a public narrative has built an expectation that the special counsel will explain his conclusions, but I think that expectation may be seriously misplaced. Justice Department rules require Mueller to submit at least a confidential report when his work is done. The decision to release the document will more than likely rest with William Barr, Trump's pick to become attorney general. He has not committed to making the report public. Today, the Senate voted to advance his nomination, which means we may see his final confirmation, largely along party lines, this week. 
president seems more than aware of that, at least he did today. Here's what he told his acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker, during a cabinet meeting at the White House. Maybe at some point you won't be uh, doing what you're doing. Come here. I think you've done, you've taken a tremendous amount of abuse. You handled yourself incredibly last Friday. Uh, but on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you very much. Matt Whitaker. So with that round of applause, let's bring in our leadoff panel for a Tuesday night. Ned Price, former senior analyst at the CIA, former senior director on the National Security Council, former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, who spent 25 years as a federal prosecutor, and the aforementioned Tom Hamburger, Washington Post national reporter. And Tom, because it's your reporting we're discussing here tonight, I'd like you to begin um, and talk about the setting of this meeting at this club not far from here in Midtown Manhattan why it matters the more we learn about it, why it could be foundational. Brian, it was, uh, as you described it, an unusual meeting at an unusual place um, at the uh, height of the 2016 presidential campaign, August 2nd. Paul Manafort, the campaign chair, leaves campaign headquarters in Trump Tower and goes over to 666, to the 666 building and to a club at the top called the uh, uh, Grand Havana Room, a cigar club. And there he and his campaign lieutenant, Rick Gates, meet with a visiting foreign national, Konstantin Kalimnik, a person who has since been identified by prosecutors as having ties to Russian intelligence. and. The meeting occurs at the height of the campaign. Um, three men meet, and one of the things we know from the bits of uh, courtroom court records that have been, have not been redacted and that we've been able to review is that they chose to leave separately so that their meeting uh, would have uh, a lower chance of, of, of being seen. So they, they all um, uh, meet uh, secretly for dinner um, and then leave this Grand Havana cigar room separately. And the things that we believe and that prosecutors have asked about that they discussed at that meeting are viewed as potentially very significant. Uh, there's something else, Tom, and as best you can, walk us through where in the calendar of events that resulted in the Trump presidency this falls. This is, what, days after Russia, if you're listening, and 17 days before Manafort leaves the campaign. That's correct. And, uh, and there are a couple of other things that go on in the background as we put together this timeline. One is that just two days before this meeting, um, uh, uh, Donald candidate Donald Trump also um, offers some seemingly sympathetic words to the Kremlin. He suggests that maybe the folks in Crimea uh, were not all that unhappy to have their territory um, uh, sort of repossessed by Russia and becoming part of Russia, no longer part of Ukraine. Uh, the campaign is moving into high gear at this point, and yet Paul Manafort and his lieutenant Rick Gates take time away from headquarters to meet with this visiting Russian national. Uh, Joyce Vance, we always assume Mr. Mueller's effort is way out ahead of everybody else on this, but if you are part of the Mueller effort, Joyce, what interests you most about all of this? Here we actually have a clue from one of Mueller's prosecutors who, in the earlier he, uh, hearing with Mr. Manafort, much of which was redacted, we learned that there's real interest in this meeting, and it's viewed as, as being sort of a seminal meeting uh, in the Mueller investigation. And I think that that's because, Brian, it goes to one of these foundational questions. Was this uh, Manafort out with a little side hustle, essentially, where he was trying to get old debts repaid by doing favors to the Russians? Or were there other folks in the Trump campaign who were involved in this sort of coordination back and forth with Russians sharing campaign information? That's a question that Mueller certainly is eager to answer. Uh, and Ned, uh, uh, talk about Mueller, uh, Manafort. Wow, I just merged the two men. <laughs> Manafort as a potential uh, uh, target here, as a potential dupe. He's living part time in Trump Tower. He offers Donald Trump his services for nothing. And we know he had, shall we say, mounting financial obligations in his personal life. 
That's right. And we also know, Brian, that those mounting financial obligations uh, led to this desire of his to be made whole. And uh, there is great reason to suspect, including uh, on the backs of some fantastic investigative reporting, uh, that he actually took this position at the helm of the Trump campaign, uh, not in order to have another successful campaign under his belt as a uh, Republican political operative, uh, but precisely to be made whole. And so it's interesting that time and again, including in this August 2nd, 2016 interaction with this uh, associate of Russian intelligence, Konstantin Kalimnik, uh, we see Paul Manafort discussing things that uh, could have significant material value for the Russians. There, there's this idea of a Ukrainian peace plan, which is more, uh, which is less Ukrainian peace plan and uh, more all-out victory uh, for the Russians, because it, it would essentially bestow upon them sanctions relief. Uh, and that's something uh, that they have long sought in just about all of their interactions with the Americans ever since those sanctions were placed on them uh, in 2014 after Vladimir Putin's uh, incursion into Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Uh, also, in this case, we understand that he was discussing polling data. And that raises another important question. Why precisely was Paul Manafort sharing what we understand to be very detailed polling data at this late stage in the campaign uh, with this associate of Russian intelligence. Uh, and it's enticing, as Joyce mentioned, as you mentioned, that Mueller's prosecutors say this gets to the heart of the matter, as if the heart of their matter uh, is, is determining whether this, in fact, was collusion, what we saw here. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.